So when you talk about the power of analytics, it's basically to answer questions such as what happened, where and when, why did it happen, and then looking into the future of what might happen. And if it does, what do you do about it? That's where the field of data science comes in. Data science is basically data-driven science, where you use many analytic tools, advanced ones, scientific methods, and your algorithms to find the answers and to disseminate that across the entire organization, disseminating your answers and knowledge. That's what data science is. Simply broken up, it's got three stages. The first one is data prep, where you source the data. It comes from various formats, all the way from files to cloud stores. And then it's how fast the data flows. Is it real-time streaming data, or is it batch data? And then you go on to trying to validate the data, cleanse the data, and so on. And then once you move on to analysis, the co-location of your data and the compute matters a lot. And then you do some feature engineering, where you build the model, you fit the model, and then you validate, and then you deploy into production. Once you do that, the value of data science comes through when you're able to create information products and disseminate them across the organization that tells the story, that gives the answers. What you saw earlier, uh, Lauren and uh, Marjean were able to show how good and complete and powerful the data science experience can be if you are a GIS analyst. And that whole experience is within ArcPy and the Pro application. Another alternative, which is pretty popular in the data science community, is Python notebooks. We have an experience that can drive analysis across the platform and disseminate the answers. If you look deeper into the notebook experience, it's powered by the RTS API for Python. It was designed for data science work. That includes machine learning and deep learning experiences where you have to build the model, you have to fit the model, validate it, and then you deploy the model into production. All of those workflows. Simply said, it's your lab for enterprise data science. So for that, I'd like to invite my colleague, Rohit Singh, to show us a few examples. Rohit? Sure, Jay. Jupyter Notebook is a, a, an interactive browser-based uh, IDE of sorts where you can document the, uh, the analysis you're doing. You can put in the methodologies you're using and uh, the code to arrive at your results. Here's an analysis on finding places where clinics for patients with ALS, which is a rare neurological disease, could be established to improve patient care. So I'm connecting to my GIS and searching for items that are tagged with ALS. That's one of the ways in which you could organize and search your content. And I have a layer of where the patients are, the clinics that they need to visit on an ongoing basis, 90 minutes of drive times from those clinics, as well as candidate cities, locations where a new ALS clinic could be established and improve patient care. Here's the same information on a map, and you can see how patients represented in these pink dots here, especially those in the central California Valley and along the central coast, are over 90 minutes of, of drive time away from their nearest clinic, and they would benefit from a new clinic in, in that vicinity. Here I'm using network analysis to solve this problem. I'm using the solve location allocation tool from the network analysis module to identify the one city that will maximize coverage for ALS patients within a 90 minutes of, of drive time. See how readable that code is. And I'll get back my results uh, as layers that I can then query as a table using pandas, bring it in the notebook, or visualize them on a map that I'm creating here. And using some rendering code that I have in this cell here, let's visualize our results. And we see a map being drawn with some beautiful cartography all done using code. And with the recent updates to the Python API, you can now save a map that you've authored in the notebook, create an information product like a web map that's a result of your analysis. So that was using network analysis, which could be done using ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise. And uh, many real-world uh, 
problems also deal with large amounts of data and you want to do uh, vector and raster analysis on them uh, using uh, distributed and scalable processing. Let's have a look at one such problem that's to do with the recent Thomas fire that grew into California's fires ever. Using satellite imagery, it's easy to visualize the extent of damage. Here's a neighborhood that's been completely destroyed by the fire. Here's an affected hospital. I'm using the Landsat layer from the Living Atlas to first get a visual assessment of the fire using its natural color image. And you can see how there's a lot of smoke and haze obscuring the view. But by extracting the 641 band combination, I can see through some of that smoke and haze, visualize the burnt areas, that's the burn scar caused by the fire. And if you look close enough, you'll also see some raging active fires in that region. And for comparison, here's the same area from before the fire. Now, this might look like a static image on a web page, but it's far from that. The notebook is a living, breathing document, and uh, it's like, it's like a, a playground, uh, where it's like a laboratory where analysts and data scientists could run their experiments with data. So if you want to try out a different band combination, go ahead, do it. Next, I do a quantitative assessment to delineate the burnt areas and identify the severity of the fire. I'll be computing the difference in the normalized burn ratio. And using band arithmetic, map algebra, and the over 200 raster functions that we give you out of the box, it's easy to create this kind of a raster processing chain, which when applied to the data lets me uh, derive the area consumed by the fire and plot its uh, distribution by the severity. And here I'm using a Python charting library to do that. I can add the results to a map, visualize the burnt areas, and here it's using dynamic image processing. As I'm zooming and panning around, it's processing those pixels just for the display resolution on the fly. What we really want to do is do this analysis at the source resolution across my entire area of interest and derive a feature layer that can be used across the platform, be it for uh, network analysis, impact assessment, or, and so on. That's where geoanalytics and raster analysis comes in. All I need to do is call this method, and it transmits this chain to ArcGIS Enterprise, leverages the power of the enterprise to distribute it across image server and arrive at this feature layer, using which I can then do an impact assessment that I'm doing here on the road and transportation infrastructure, as well as the impact on, on humans that I'm doing by querying the demographic profile of people within the fire perimeter and visualizing it as an age pyramid uh, using the recently added geo-enrichment module in the Python API. Now, when these incidents occur, we often pause and ponder on the causes and the factors affecting it. And is there something that we could do about uh, addressing those? Here's a notebook that, that's using historical data on nearly 2 million US wildfires over the past 24 years. And given all this data, can we answer these questions, whether the number of wildfires is increasing over time, which are the areas that are the most or least fire prone? And perhaps the burning question, can machine learning libraries uh, classify the cause of a fire given some data that's available when the fire is just discovered? Using the spatial data frame in the Python API, you can now read in local data from shape files or file geodatabases, bring it in the notebook as a pandas data frame, you can do exploratory data analysis using Python charting libraries. So here, excuse me, here I'm uh, visualizing the number of fires over the years and fitting a trend line that shows that, yes, the number does tend to increase uh, over the years. We see how natural causes such as lightning account for only a small fraction of the number of fires. And by plotting the numbers of fires by day of week, we see how fires due to arson represented 
in the orange bars here tend to go up during the weekends, whereas those due to natural causes like lightning remain about the same as expected. We can bring this data into ArcGIS and find the statistically significant clusters of these fires using the Find Hotspots tool. And finally, we can bring all of this data into machine learning libraries like scikit-learn. We can add features to our model using geo-enrichment and get a nearly 92% accuracy at classifying uh, if, if the fire was the result of arson given some basic data. And this analysis could give investigators a data-driven way to prioritize cases for further investigation. Thank you, and back to you, Ji. Thank you, Rohit. <laughs> so that was a quick fly through of how you can use analysis across the platform. But where is the analysis being done? Of course, he's running it in a notebook server. The first example, the ALS example, he invoked ready-to-use tools in online and rather the location and allocation uh, uh, tool. In the second example, uh, the Thomas Fire example, uh, he basically invoked image processing, raster analysis, and geoanalytics in ArcGIS Enterprise. But there's more you can do, and that's what Rohit showed when he brought it scikit-learn as a library within the Python notebook and invoked it, trying to classify the cause of a fire. Now, there's more you can do, of course, because of the power of compute that's available in all of these. And as you've realized by now, these are not mutually exclusive. The combination is extremely powerful. Earlier today, Seth talked about deep learning coming into the platform. As an example, image analysts being able to do object recognition and classification in a ready-to-use experience with uh, models that are pre-trained. That's coming. But you can do quite a bit today if you're a data scientist, and I'm assuming some of you in the audience are familiar with deep learning techniques. You can do all of that today because these libraries are available within the notebook itself. In the Python API, you can access these. And Rohit, can you show us a quick demo of the possibilities in this space? Sure, Jay. Uh, computers have achieved superhuman accuracy at classifying images. And today, I'll show you how uh, we can use a deep convolutional neural network to recognize not cats and dogs, but objects in satellite imagery. I'll show how you can take a pre-trained convolutional neural network that was trained on images that looks like cats and dogs and, and use transfer learning and make it detect uh, sites where surface-to-air missiles or, in short, SAMs are deployed. That's an interesting public data set that I found online, and I, I just had to try it out. So the first thing that deep learning needs is labeled data. That's where ArcGIS comes in. It, it, it works great if you've got thousands of images to train on. Uh, with its rich collection of S3 curated content, as well as data shared by thousands of users worldwide, I'm sure to find what I'm looking for. And today, it's locations of SAM sites. Next, I need high-resolution imagery. Not a problem. I can use the S3 world imagery layer. Then it's a simple matter of iterating through the locations of those SAM sites, getting their bounds, and exporting image chips to train my deep learning model. This is what those SAM sites look like. This is what the model will learn to recognize. And here are the negative samples. These are uh, areas that are not SAM sites that are labeled as, as ground. I can then feed, feed this data into this other notebook where I'm using a library called Fast AI to automate this process, train my deep learning model. I've pointed it at the data we just saw. And I'm using ResNet, which is uh, a pre-trained convolutional neural network that was trained on over 1 million images of, of ImageNet and uh, making it, fine-tuning it to work on satellite imagery instead. So that's three lines of code, a few training loops, and I already have an accuracy over 96%. Let's see what that means in form of pictures. These are some images that were correctly classified. These are some which were incorrectly classified. 
the most correct ground, images that most look like SAM sites to the classifier, and some SAM sites uh, where my model couldn't pick them up. We can improve this model. We can do better by choosing an optimum learning rate and doing data augmentation, that is, by randomly flipping, zooming, and rotating those images, I can make the model uh, work better with my relatively small training data set and, and make it generalize better, so avoid overfitting. And using recent advances in deep learning, like stochastic gradient descent with restarts, and carefully fine-tuning the earlier layers of my deep learning model using differential learning rate annealing, I get a model that's state-of-the-art at classifying these SAM sites. Using test time augmentation, I'm getting an accuracy over 99.7%. What does that mean? Looking at the confusion matrix, we see that my model was perfect at predicting the ground images, and it only missed two SAM sites. And here are the two sites that it missed. And don't you think that the image on the right really looks more like ground than a SAM site? Now we are ready to test it in a new area that the model has not seen. And I'm going to use sliding windows over it to try and detect a SAM site here. And it does. To summarize, I used a public feature layer as the source of my labeled data. I used the Python API to extract image chips fed that data into a pre-trained convolutional neural network, fine-tuned it to work on satellite imagery uh, using transfer learning, and I tested it out on, uh, uh, using the Python API all within the notebook. The model is now ready to be deployed using Python raster functions and applied across a large geographical area using distributed raster analysis. Thanks. Back to you, Jay. Thanks again, Rohit. Thank you, Jim. Awesome again. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so as you can see, data science is a very collaborative exercise. Folks in the data science team often play different roles. And what you have in the RTS platform is the different experiences, right from insights to the data science experience through Pro and ArcPy and Python notebooks. So I'd like to invite you to go check it out. And thank you very much.